The next thing we do is we consider the sum. We consider the sum s sub n, which is the sum of the product of f of p sub m, which is the value of the function f of z at the point p sub m. And we evaluate that along the interval delta z sub m. So what we're doing is we're saying that the function is defined at this particular point p sub m. So we get the value of the function at that particular point, which is this, and we multiply it by delta z to calculate the total value of our function along that segment of the curve. In order to calculate the total then, of course, we sum along the whole curve, going from m is equal to 1 to m is equal to n. This, of course, is exactly what happens with the Riemann sum. Now, if we allow n to go to infinity, so we don't change the length of our curve, but we increase the number of points, well, the curve becomes a series of points, and they're all separated. Of course, they're separated by t sub m minus 1, excuse me, t sub m plus 1 minus t sub m, or t sub m and t sub m minus 1. But in the limit, this, of course, goes to 0. The separation in the points goes to 0, as, of course, we add an infinite number of points. This means that delta z sub m will also go to 0. So as the point z sub m and z sub m minus 1 get closer and closer closer together, delta z sub m is going to go to 0. This means that our sum s sub n becomes a sequence of complex numbers. And this is what our line integral is. So we go from a discrete sum to a continuous integral. To write that explicitly, we have our sum here, and in the limit, it becomes our line integral. So we say we have our integral, we say along the curve c of f of z dz. Where the start and end point on c coincide, we have our closed line integral here, which we donate by having a closed circle given onto the integral sign, and we give the direction along which we integrate by what I've written here is a purple arrow. That is a closed line integral, or a closed contour integral, or a closed path integral. I hope that wasn't too difficult. In fact, I'd be surprised if, uh, if it's anything new to you. Before we continue, I'd just like to do a small bit of uh, revision. We are performing the line integral of our function f of z, the complex function f of z, along a curve in the complex plane C. Of course, if the start and end points of C match or coincide, we're talking about the closed line integral. Now, let's say we have our function f of z, and I'm going to call it w just for, just for clarity. So w is our function f of z, but it's a complex function, and every complex function can be written as the sum of a real component, let's call it u, and an imaginary component, let's call it v. But it's a function of z, and z is a function of x, the real component, and y, the imaginary component. Putting this together, it allows us to rewrite w, which is our complex function, as u plus i times v, where u is a function of x and y, and so is v. So we have our function f of z, which up until now we've only we've just left it at that. We now make the substitution that it's a real component u plus an imaginary component v, each of which depends on x and y. Now what we do is we plug this into our sum s sub n, which we have seen already. Delta z, of course, is nothing else other than delta x sub m plus i times delta y sub m. If we put that into our expression s sub n, we can rearrange for the real and the imaginary components separately. This I have done here. So there are real components, and here are our imaginary components. Now since f, u, and v are all continuous, as n approaches infinity, or we get more and more points on the closed curve, let's say, c, the greatest delta x sub m and delta y sub m will approach zero and we will get the real line integral. 
This is written on the bottom of your screen. What I've done is I've rearranged so that we have the real integrals and the imaginary integrals separate. The line integrals exist and it is independent of choice of subdivisions or intermediate p sub m.